When we're talking about grassland restoration, we often focus on restoring old fields or restoring something from a previous condition. CRP uh, or grassland restorations, as you've seen throughout this video, where we take an old field, we plant it back, we try to manage it for a new suite of native species. But part of the restoration process also is trying to recover native systems that have been abused or degraded over time, either with heavy grazing chemicals or both. And that's similar to the site that you see behind me here today. It's a native pasture, uh, very close to what would have been the historic building site of a dairy farm. And it's just uh, the place that got used and overused and abused year after year. Most of the native plant community is completely gone from this site. Uh, so the remnant is cool season exotic grasses, Kentucky bluegrass and brome, which we've discussed, uh, Canada thistle, uh, dandelion, things that are just not very representative of that native plant community. But the key is, is that the soil has never been turned. And the question always is, how do I recover that native pasture? How can I make that remnant uh, something better than it is today? How can I get those old plants, if they're still there and present, to express themselves? What we've got here today is this first phase of recovery of a native remnant. It's like phase zero, ground zero. So what do we, what do we have? What do we, what do we want to fix? And like I said, we've got brome, Kentucky bluegrass, dandelion, thistle. So this is what we inherit. And we have to apply some of our known tools. The toolbox is, um, is pretty extensive, really. We can look at prescribed burning. We can look at uh, better timing of grazing practices. We can look at some options for very targeted chemical application, depending on what we're trying to achieve. So in this case, uh, what we're going to talk about we're going to this time is a uh, kind of a, a lighter approach to the recovery. Um, in this case, we will walk through a series of prepping it for prescribed burning, burning a site like this, and uh, allowing the site to tell us what the plant community looks like. The fire response will help, will give us a very good indicator of what we've got to work with. And then we'll be able to make our decisions based on the initial plant recovery or, that, we, that we see. So, do we need more chemicals? Do we want to enhance it with seed and if we are going to enhance it with seed what's the source of that seed what's the appropriate way to uh, to plant that so let's go and look at phase two so this is what step two of the recovery process of the native uh, degraded pasture might look like uh, for most parts of south dakota so this was grazed early in the spring and this is the recovery period now here in late August. Many would look at this and say, oh, there's enough fuel there for a fire. Uh, and there may be, but the, the objective here is to try to grow enough fuel in that year that you intend to burn. Now, this again was grazed this spring. I would suggest not doing that. There really isn't enough fuel here for us to yet burn next, next spring late enough in the season. So the reason I'm showing this in our video today is what you think you've, as it looks like a great fuel load is a lot of water and not very much plant material. And by the time this site goes through a South Dakota winter, it, we would be surprised, almost shocked at next spring, how little fuel there really is on this site. So spring grazing um, ahead of a fire isn't really conducive to your, your best fuel loading. And I just wanted to point that out. Our next stop will show you what a full season of uh, fuel loading really looks like, which will allow us to burn with the heat, the intensity, and the timing that we really need to help us um, stimulate that native plant community. So we looked at uh, what that first initial phase is of going into a, a native um, remnant pasture. We looked at what it means to, to graze in the spring and think that you can kind of get away with grazing and then build enough fuel for the for the fire for the following year and now what i'm showing you is what it means to stay off of it completely now we have had a great growing season this year in eastern south dakota and this brome is four and a half feet tall but this creates the fuel load that i want to see to be able to burn next spring and time my burning when i want to and this fuel load will allow me to burn as late as the end of May into early June, depending on my plant community objectives. Had I grazed this this spring, 
we would um, be very limited in the time period that we could burn next spring and we'd have to probably probably have to uh, burn that off in April um, maybe early May we could get away with it yet or else but then we would end up running out of fuel load and end up with too much green up to meet our objectives so I really advocate if you're going to take the time to try to recover a native pasture commit to staying off of it with the grazing and allow that fuel load to build up to allow you to really be able to take advantage of that investment in prescribed fire if that's the tool that you choose to use. Conversely, if fire isn't on the table, early spring pressure on brome and bluegrass and then getting off of it uh, prior to July 1st or so date will allow any of the net remnant native grasses that are out there to express themselves but they won't express themselves nearly as prevalently as they generally do um, with a prescribed burn. So choose your tools wisely, um, but I would say that I'm gonna lean toward prescribed fire because it's the great truth teller. It will tell you what your plant community does and does not look like and what you've got to work with. So the site that we're on right now, we, we rested a season, built an appropriate fuel load, and we've actually done that twice over now. So this has received two fires in the last three years. And sometimes it's a process of, re of uh, slow recovery. But as you can see, the plant community is starting to talk to us a little bit. We've got big blue stem, we've got Indian grass, we've got side oats grama, we've got native, what we call our stipas or our green needle grass. Uh, we've got um, still a a background population of undesirables. There's still some Kentucky bluegrass, some brome. We've uh, woke up a few broadleaves like alfalfas, but we've also got our native broadleaves. We've got echinacea showing up. We've got our purple prairie clover and our white prairie clover showing up. We've got an abundance of milkweed, which is kind of disturbance oriented. So sometimes it takes a few years for that plant community to, to talk back to us. Um, and of course there's sacrifice in this. We, we gain this by not grazing this during this recovery phase. These plants, if we're gonna take the make the investment into burning, I like to see folks follow that up with um, that allowing those plants to fully mature and go through their, their life cycle. So, so this plant gets a chance to put down roots and shoots and seeds. If we come back in here after a fire and we graze this off in July or August, we we'll essentially have awoke in that plant, but not given it an opportunity enough to really reestablish itself, its own foundation. These, these blue stem plants that are, we've got next to us here are healthy and vibrant, and they will perpetuate with improved management. So the question, of course, is, well, we can't afford to burn every year. We've got to graze at some point. And yes, that's true. So this site has enough native recovery that I'm okay with now backing off on the fire for a year or two, doing early spring or late fall grazing, putting the pressure on the shoulder seasons on these native or on these exotic cool season grasses, and maybe staying off of this during the key recovery period of midsummer, which is July through about August 15th, allowing these native plants to go through their, their full cycle of uh, seed recovery. And then again, in a few years, um, we don't have to be as intense. A recovery burn, a maintenance burn here and there um, will allow this site to continually recover toward more of a native plant community. I, we, we probably aren't ever going to knock out 100% of the, of the uh, undesirable species, but what we're looking for is natives coming into that and having a better balance for a better balanced grazing diet, better balanced wildlife habitat, next year's nesting cover, um, nutritional, requirements of our livestock. All of that improves if we've got native plants healthy and vibrant in the system. The pasture that we're in right now is uh, my personal pasture. It's been a, a, a personal journey, an experiment for me as a scientist, as a landowner, as a producer. Um, I run a, a small um, herd of heifers on this. But what I wanna point out is where we're at in the journey and the process. So this is a native remnant pasture, never been broken, but as bad as far as a plant community as anything I had ever seen coming into it. Only brome, bluegrass, and quackgrass. Canada thistle, 
and a few other bad nasties were, were in this pasture. Production was horrible. Maybe, maybe on, a, on the first two years, I might have averaged 1,000 pounds per acre, and that's in black soil, eastern South Dakota. So very, very suppressed plant community. And I'm gonna walk you through what we did as far as putting all of these pieces together. It's a small scale, and I'm not saying that this is replicable anywhere, but it does, I think, give us hope that we can improve a plant community. Uh, the first step was simply rest. We just needed to rest this plant community. We needed to rest this pasture. So after we purchased it, we, um, we didn't do anything out here other than let, just let it go, kind of manage the, the Canada thistle, very much like the Canada thistle population um, that we were just in uh, at the other pasture. Um, very prominent Canada thistle, uh, especially on to, to, the, uh, to your right as you're watching this video. Um, I did do some very select backpack spraying um, application of a chemical called Transline early on. And you know, it goes back to that saying, um, manage for what you want instead of against what you don't want. I was bitter, I was frustrated, I was managing thistle all the time and I really wasn't, hadn't pulled the trigger on what I knew to be true as far as other tools. So after we built a fuel load after a couple of years, I started applying prescribed fire to this pasture. No grazing, just rest, recovery, fuel load, and fire. And probably did that two or three different times. Um, and then we started acquiring some livestock. And we started working livestock into the picture a little bit. We also had, were fortunate enough to have a two acre uh, prairie restoration field that had a really good native seed crop that, I've been able, that I was able to grab from my own stock. So what I would do out here, my, me and my family and, and friends, we burned and then I, I, a couple times I scratched it with just a light drag with a four-wheeler just to kind of try to break the sod surface. Took the seed out of the other field and did my best to distribute it out here as much as I could and, um, and waited. Grazing, fire, interaction, quit spraying completely. And now you fast forward to 2024, uh, we, we purchased this in 2004 and here we are in 2024 where it finally feels like everything has kind of come together to your left on screen or to my right here you can see that we've got a tremendous catch of big blue stem indian grass side oats we've also got liatris or what we call the blazing stars or the gay feathers we've got um, cudweed sagewort this is not our this is not our noxious sage this is actually a native plant going to seed very very excellent plant we've got ragweed which is a native plant of course we've got sunflowers um, things are starting to finally come together on this site and as you can see to this side though we still have a tremendous Canada thistle problem but if we look deeper into that Canada thistle you start to see annual sunflowers black-eyed Susans um, cone flowers if we even look a little closer we can see big blue stem Indian grass are dispersed throughout. We've got goldenrods. So this is why I will refuse to spray this plant community. The other thing I've got on these thistles that I think I'm fortunate of is we've got a fungus that keeps a lot of this thistle from going to seed, not all of it. But um, there's too much to be lost here to, um, to continue to spray or to initiate spraying again on this site. So we're just gonna keep, keep trucking along with fire and grazing and uh, in another 10 years, who knows, but I think we've, we've got something to fight for on a, on a site like this. And there's a lot of freedom when restoring um, old fields because if we don't quite get it right the first time, we can, we can always hit the do-over. That's something that we don't really have that necessarily as many tools or freedom to do on the native remnant uh, grasslands. So in this case, what we're standing in is an old soybean field. Um, and it's been, it's almost uh, 20 years since this has been planted. And we often talk about diversity and monocultures. And to avoid uh, a stand becoming a complete monoculture of say tall, just big bluegrass and Indian grass, we still have to manage these sites. So this site, once it was established, uh, there's about 60 species in this site. It's been a, um, a, a, a balance of, an, of spring burning occasionally, 
uh, grazing throughout the grazing season occasionally. Every year we try to do something just a little bit different to keep the, uh, the, the timing and the intensity, also keeping all of those things diverse. So it's just been grazing and fire, but, but in, a, in a quite of a mixed up system, allowing different uh, species to ebb and flow and ultimately keeping the entire grassland healthy. Uh, this site has been used for seed harvest, it's used for hunting, it's been used for grazing. We've, um, we've hayed it once, we've burned it, um, and there's very, very few exotic invaders in this, in this plant community. So that's, that's kind of like a great uh, fairy tale ending to restoring an old field. It takes time, it takes uh, dedication. 